we are rolling. So. Uh, before we start uh, proper, let me make one more comment based on a question that I got during the um, uh, the break, the half an hour time between the tutorial and now. Um, I got a question, and I think it's something that I should share with everybody. The question that I got was, uh, if you have a four vector, yes, or, well, no, let's rephrase. If you have four numbers, and you have put them together in this column, We have been checking for a couple of these things that there are indeed four vectors, yes, but um, I want to show you that it's certainly not a triviality that everything that you write as four of these numbers indeed is a four vector. So let me deliberately give you one that is not, okay? Now, I say numbers, but in principle these could be functions, yes, of space and time each. So this is some function of space and time, let me ignore the y and the z parts do everything in x direction. This is a function of space and time, this is a function of space and time, this is a function of space and time, and these are not the four same functions. Right. Now, let me, it's going to make one up here. Uh, the zeroth part of this is going to be the logarithm of x divided by t. That certainly is a function of x and t. Mm -hmm. right. There might be a unit issue there, but forget about that, okay? If you don't like units, put some number in front that makes the units go come out. Okay, that's not the point here. And you know what, let's make this one. Let, let's make that t plus x to the power t. Certainly a function of space and time, agreed? Yep. And maybe you can think of some other ones of these. Now, we can check whether this is a four vector. How do we check that? Well, we're going to see what this thing will look like in some other guy's growth frame, hence the prime and see whether the thing we get out is just this thing, Lorentz transformed, right? That, that's how you check whether this is a four vector. Go to some other guy's coordinate frame, you get new functions. Are these functions just the Lorentz transforms with these functions? If so, you have yourself a four vector. Now, help me out here. What should I do with this x here? If I go to some other guy's coordinate frame, it should become L and X primes, right? Yeah. And this should be T primes, agreed? Yeah. And this should be T primes? Let's say I'm doing everything in the other guy's coordinate system now. Plus X primes, and then this, this other stuff. I want to express this in terms of my original space and time coordinates. How do I do this? We know how x and t transform. We know how x prime is written in terms of x non prime and t non prime. So that here will become logarithm gamma x minus v. Not bothering with the c's for a moment here. This. Mm -hmm. Oh, and there's another bracket. Divided by t prime, which I also know how to write in terms of the original guy c. That is gamma t minus v x. Agreed? Let's do the same for this one now. So what does this one look like, written in terms of the original guy's coordinates? Um, the gamma. The power of t there, actually. Oh, uh, yeah, there's a t here, so that's. So gamma t minus vx plus uh, gamma x minus vt to the power of uh, gamma <laughs> t minus the x. Now, in order for this original thing to be a four vector, this should all of this should collapse to. You tell me what it should. It, but should it be in order for the original thing to have been a four vector all along? Um, L. Because we turn back to the same, so we just compare it to the first one we have now. Yeah, but you know what it should look like, right? If, if this were a four vector. The contraction of R with itself should be the same as the contraction of R 
that is certainly a good way of also checking it. And I think in the tutorial, some people posed that as a trick to see whether the mu was a four factor to take its contraction. That is certainly a way to do this. I think it's more work than we need to do. Um, if this is a four factor, yes, then that means that if I do its, uh, its Morse science form, it should be the same part. <coughs> this, right? that the original <coughs> thingies appear in the other guy's thingies as a Lorentz sense form. Mm -hmm. And this one, this here should transform as R1 minus V R0, whatever. So this is what it should be in order for this R to have been a four vector all along. Now, I made up some functions there. Question. <coughs> Is this thing likely to be the same as that thing? No. no. It doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like it, right? Maybe we officially have to check. We have to put R0, which is this thing, mm -hmm. into here. We have to put R1, that is that thing, into there. And then hopefully, it will give you back this. Probably not. It will be a huge coincidence. I just made something up. That it exactly happens to be a four vector. It would be you know, very bad for my standing as a lecturer, too, by the way. Or very good as a physicist, that I put, and whatever I spit out happens all the time. But uh, no, I mean, very likely this is not the same as that with the original R's uh, put in, and same thing here. So the point that I'm making here is, you really, really have to check whether something is a four vector. It's certainly not trivial. Most of the things you're going to write down as four functions in a column are not going to be a four vector. And I should have emphasized it a little, this a little better, I think, because we have only been looking at ones that we do know of four vectors. So, just as a good point. All right, so now um, I told you that the reason that contractions are so important is because in a world where everything changes from one system to the next, it's so good to have things that do not. So, whenever you have a theory in theoretical physics and you really wanted to agree with nature, the space time rules of nature, build it up in terms of, of contractions. Every time that you write something as a new theory of physics and you wanted to agree with at least special relativity, you only need, you only have to write it in terms of contractions. A comment that I also made before that I'm going to go to the electrodynamics is that I know that Jaco in his particle physics is constantly bombarding you with contractions. He might not have emphasized it, but he has. He has shown you things Lagrangians, yes, looking at the particle oh, physics people. Yes. Okay. okay, so can you give me a term? And I gave, I mean, surely you gave you <coughs> one the standard model or the Klein coordinate uh, equation. There's an F mu nu thing within there. Okay, there was an F mu nu in there? Actually, we're uh, contracted with the same thing within downstairs and yes. one over four in front, I think. That is very true. This is part of the standard model. It's a self interaction of the Maxwell field. That's all I remember. And you have the last term, which is M times. Five. Sure, it's five squared. Anyway, point is, this thing is a contraction by itself. But it's, it's not a contraction. I mean, it's already a scalar. Right? Now, this is contraction. Now, you might not have never never seen this, or maybe you have followed the course and you weren't exactly sure what this f is. It's actually the Maxwell tensor. It's actually electrodynamics. Um, but even if you didn't know all of these things, based on what we have done today. What do you know about this thing? Just even, not the physics, what do you know about how it does it behave from one coordinate yes. system to the other? Invariant. Same invariant. It will give you the same number, yes? And that's good, because what do Lagrangians tell you in physics? What does Lagrangian give you? Generalized Sorry? What? How physics works in a specific yeah. situation. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is the principle of least action, yes? Mm -hmm. If you have your Lagrangian, it will give you back the rules of the, the laws of physics themselves. That's the idea. Now, if you write down a theory and you want the theory to be the same all coordinate systems, maybe not the numbers, but the theory itself, the formulas. Give me a second. If you want the formulas to be to come out the same in all coordinate systems, and you know that the formulas it themselves should come from your Lagrangian, 
that obviously your, your Lagrangian itself must be invariant, yes? Your Lagrangian itself is not allowed to change from one coordinate system to the other because otherwise, every time that you go to some other guy's coordinate system, you end up with different Lagrangian and therefore with different rules of physics. Yeah. Now, how do you get a Lagrangian that is invariant? Just make it a sum of contractions. This is what Lebyago has been doing. Every Lagrange that he's shown you for the people who did particle physics were mm -hmm. of this type, and it's for this reason. Is it mm -hmm. the same uh, sigma that uh, potential field? Uh, Intensify. No, this is uh, your, well, in better context, but this would be the Klein-Gordon potential. Uh, not potential, it's Klein-Gordon self-interaction gives you the mass. Anyway, that's quantum theory, field theory. Uh, sorry, Simon, you had a question. Um, so any contraction needs some, yields something in there? Yes, any, of, any, any uh, of, of four vectors. Right, yes. but that is not a four vector. It no, it's a, no, that's true. Two. No, that's, no, that's a good point. Uh, the, the state is more general. Okay. Um, so what we've proven, or what we've discussed, was that this exactly. is a four vector. Right. Yes. This is also invariant. It's not a four vector anymore, it's a tensor, but contractions of tensors, as long as you make sure that all indices are contracted over, is also invariant. The rule generalizes to any amount of indices. But do those tensors need to be of a specific type? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Namely that if you would go to one coordinate system, for each and every of the indices, you have to apply one Lorentz transform. So this two will be the first. Yes, so this one, if you go to some other guy's coordinate system, will give you two Lorentz transforms. Anyway, this is more waters than we have to go into right now. But the point that I'm making here is you might have already seen these things in other courses without really recognizing why they were uh, the way that they were. You probably didn't need to know this background, but now that you do, maybe you can link a couple of courses together. Yes? So it's also the case that everything that's invariant is either a scalar or a contraction of no. four vectors or tensors? Uh, you can also always write it. As a contraction of them, yes. Really? That, that, that statement is true. Yes. For charge, for example, yes. we cannot write charge, uh, the total amount of charge, it's invariant normally, uh, but yes. we cannot write it as a four vector, right? Yes, we can. And, and we will today, actually. Sorry. That was the question I had before. No, 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 that was charge density. No, was, no, I was thinking about it, but can you write. So anything invariant can be write, written as a contraction? That yes. sounds weird, no? Yes. I don't know. Like, because it means that everything must have a time dependency, no? No. Or dependency. Not necessary. No, no. Well, four vectors for all things are different. different. Not all four vectors have the yes. time in the zero. But if we apply uh, a Lorentz transform, kind of no. Uh, Lorentz transforms are more general than time. time. I think these Lorentz transforms are just simply for the four vectors that we have discussed. I'm not sure about that, though. They don't have to have a time dependency. It's just the relation between the yeah. two variables. Because the time dependence comes from the fact that you take the first term, the zero term of the four vector. If your four vector but then it's another translation, it's no more Lorentz, right? Yes, it is. No, yeah, yeah, it's the Lorentz, Lorentz, you remember the matrix that we did only has gammas and these. But these gamma depends on? Gamma depends on gi. Yeah. Which depends on time, no? Yeah, the 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 is not yeah, close. Um, there is a complication here. In, in what we've done now is that we've taken our V's in the Lorentz transforms to be constants, as in that we only Lorentz transform to other coordinate systems that go with constant velocity. Yes, <coughs> okay. that we have done. Now, the generalized uh, chain rule that we wrote down during the tutorial included at some point that you had to take derivatives uh, of T prime with respect to T, for instance. That was one of the derivatives that was in there. You could use the Lorentz transform for that because you know how t prime depends on t. It's exactly a gamma in between. But in principle, the v in there could also still depend on t. Yes. So what we wrote down before to prove that d mu is a four vector is uh, we have only proved it. Let's, let's, let's put it like this: we have only proved it for the case that the two observers are moving constant velocity with respect to each other. Now, if you want to uh, put acceleration in there, you're welcome to, but you can, it, it, it's somewhat of a straightforward generalization. Right? In general, uh, chain rule, you get more terms, and things become more complicated. All right, so let's use all of this stuff, and let's go back to our main topic, and that was, uh, 
relativistic electrodynamics. So this is what we knew. And let's collect a couple of things from the tutorial just now. We also now know that dU, which is dt, dx, dy, and dz, that this is a four vector. Again, uh, just repeating myself, this is not a triviality. But we have explicitly shown that it is. Right? Now, also, let's put this in. These are the ingredients for today. Now, one thing that we had already semi-discussed during the tutorial was that if you take d mu, a contraction with itself, you get an invariant because it's a contraction of two four vectors. Okay, no question there. But it's also a Lambertian squared, or it's just Lambertian. The Lambertian we already had; it was here. That was what we derived even before we knew about contractions of special relativity and such. So we have this beautiful uh, result here. I'm looking for colored markers for a second. <coughs> People, I have no idea where my head is today. This whole palette of beautiful colored markers. Pretty sure I brought them. Uh, you don't have any? <laughs> don't ask me. Okay, go on. I love how you didn't say you didn't have any, you still don't ask me. Okay, I don't have any. Okay, let's go with that. Okay, pretend there's some colors on, this, on, on the board, okay? So, uh, that means that, okay. that, that part is invariant. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Can we all just make a mental note that I give this back to him? Right, I forgot last time. All right, so, really, thank you. I could use some colors here. So, this thing is invariant. And uh, exactly as Vladimir was saying, and again, I'm very happy with the phrase that he used, it means that the structure of the equation is invariant. So you can go to another guy's coordinate system, and if you want to, to calculate how much scalar potential this guy sees, the amount of scalar potential will probably be a different number. The phi itself will also change, yes? But the rule that the phi will follow is the same as in the original frame, because the rule Every the thing that defines how phi looks, given the charge density, is given by this operator. The operator is invariant. So the structure of the theory is going to be the same in all coordinate systems. So that's a very big conclusion. And again, we did not put that in. That was already in there from the outset when we built up the theory. This is what came out. And with our new knowledge on contractions and these things being invariant, we can now, in retrospect, see that it was invariant all along. So that's very good. Again, small repeat of what I said during the tutorial. When we use these laws and we set both sides to zero, that means that we made right-hand sides, we made those invariant as well, right? Because zero is going to be zero everywhere. If you have zero in one frame, you have zero in other frames. So if you set these to zero, then right-hand side is uh, invariant. The operator is invariant, so that means that the solution must be invariant. Agreed? And that means that the conclusions that we drew from this solution, do you know what the conclusions were? It's already a couple of weeks ago. But do you remember what the outcome was for phi if this was zero? So a vacuum phi had a particular... Uh, oh, yeah, t minus uh, c... Uh, x over c, c or c x. Yeah, something like this, right? Yeah. That if this is zero, then this comes out, and from this we concluded that uh, scalar potentials move at the speed of light in vacuum. But because this conclusion we draw from an equation that we now know is invariant, completely invariant, right hand side is invariant, the left hand side is invariant, the conclusion is invariant, so the speed of light is invariant. Okay? And of course, again, this is how you typically get taught special relativity, that as a starting point. We now conclude it. So we've really done something new here. All right, now. Let's look at a situation where right-hand side is not invariant. Because you agree with me that rho and j are not invariant quantities themselves, right? Yeah. Um, can somebody maybe give a one-line 
reason why that is the case? Um, for example, for the chart distribution, if we have a Lorentz contraction, for example, mm -hmm. um, then we have like more charge in a, the same amount of charge, but in a smaller volume. Yes. I mean, both of them are, are volumes, right? So this one is very obviously not going to be invariant. If you go to some other guy's frame, then the amount of charge per cube, and the cube itself, in one direction at least, will have a con contracted, <laughs> forcibly, same name, different thing. And now literally mean smaller in space, not contraction in the mathematical <coughs> terms, in terms of the words. Same uh, charge, smaller space, you get a bigger amount of density. So this is certainly not invariant, and this one isn't either, because by, Calculation. again, it's, uh, well, it's two things here. First of all, it's, it, again, it's, it's an amount of volume, uh, uh, charge per volume, but there's a velocity of the volume involved as well. So it's now the volume and its velocity that's going to change from one guy's coordinate system to the other. So the, the non-vacuum uh, 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 versions of these equations are certainly not going to be invariant. Okay. Now, I'm going to make a claim and let's see if we can build up that claim and see what comes out and then maybe prove the claim even. Here's my claim. I'm going to write down a new vector, J mu. Defined as four functions. Your uh, charge density in the zeroth part, and then your three currents in the spatial parts, the one to three parts. Claim this is a four vector. Who dares? <laughs> <coughs> Still things we can do. We can dwell on this for a while. We're certainly going to do this at some point. We can also just take it as fact for now back to it later and then show what happens if this is the case. I prefer to do the latter, but maybe in the meantime you can think about why I so boldly can claim that this is the four vector. In fact, we have already seen it at some point during the, le during the previous lectures, but secretly we weren't talking yet about contractions. But we have already seen the proof of this. So I'll let you think on this for a while. Let's assume that this is a four vector, yes? Anything to do with continuity equations? Damn it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. I was. <clears throat> yeah, let's pick it up right now. All right, let's do that. I was planning on moving forward and then coming back to what people thought about it, but you already have. So, Sorry. what is the continuity? No, it's fine, it's fine, it's good. So, what is the continuity equation? Um, uh, I think it was at the time derivative of rho, is that correct? So, put a minus the. I think great, so not great divergence of A? Uh, not A, there's no A. Uh, sorry, J, yeah. Do you remember this equation? Yes. We had it in our very first lecture. <laughs> yes. Now, oh, yeah, makes sense. So what does this mean, physically? I mean, sure, I can write this down, and we're going to do something with it. In fact, I'm going to use this to prove that this must be a four vector. Why, why does this hold physically speaking? Well, it, it means that if you have an amount of charge at some point and this amount changes over time, it was transported away by a current J. Yes. Yeah. That's it, yes? That if you find that this number is changing in time, so you had a certain amount of charge here, and you wait two seconds and you find, wait a minute, there's now less charge than there was, then it must have moved away through space. A current must have been there. Agreed? Yeah. Alright, that's this part in the minus sign. It has been carried off. It's been taken away. So, this, if you will, you can just call an experimental fact. You cannot end up uh, with less charge if it has not been carried away. This is not the same thing as just saying that charge is conserved. Charge conserved just means that if you have a certain amount here, and you find two seconds later it's not there anymore, that it must have popped up somewhere else in the universe. Okay. This is a stronger <coughs> statement. It says, it, 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 sure, it's somewhere else in the universe, but it must have moved through the intermittent space. It can't just teleport, like basically. It, it, yeah, it's, 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 so the fact that this is, uh, this being zero, d rho dt, means that charge is conserved, but it's allowed to teleport. 
pop up a database in the universe. Isn't it like the principle of minimal action or something that it looks like? I'm not seeing that. Why is that? I don't know. Like same idea with the what you gave in natural relativity with when you gave the definition of like Rentians and principle of minimal action and where it could have the, all the possibilities where it could have moved and then yes it's kind of the restrictive part so probably like the limit of no I see a vague connection but I cannot really make it full I mean I understand what you're talking about in the principle of minimal action what you have is that if you look at all the possible ways that things could have moved Mm -hmm. There's only one of them that, that the way it has moved. Mm -hmm. That is the one that has the minimal or the maximal amount of action. Yeah, but it probably is like yeah, boundaries to the possibilities or something like that. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, th there is something there. It might be that in the principle of minimal action, you're already assuming that how it has moved, it could also not have teleported. In that sense, there might be a connection. So, but we understand this, yes? Mm -hmm. But it also means that you can, if you want, you can write this as DDT rho plus ddx jx plus ddy or jy plus ddz agree with this part? literally the same thing is algebra okay can we write this as a contraction? looks like it you have more metro up there okay well help me my claim is this can be written as a contraction it's a contraction of d mu or j Like this? And it is zero, right? Yeah. Okay. So from here to here, this is mathematics, yes? Don't worry about minus signs. If you remember, <coughs> contraction just means uh, take mu to <coughs> every single value, zero and zero, one and one, two and two, three and three, and add everything together, adding. The minus only comes in at the moment that maybe you raise or lower a couple of these mu's and u's or something like that. You bring them from upstairs and downstairs. This is when you possibly get minuses. We're not doing this here. We're just literally taking mu to have every single of the four values and adding. No minuses. The minus would come in at the moment that I would take this one upstairs or downstairs. We're not doing it here. Do you also see why it is important that uh, the derivative is a covariant uh, four vector here? Yes, exactly. If we would have found in the tutorial that yes, a derivative is a four vector, but it was contravariant, like this, then it would have been something like this. And then you cannot write it as a. And then you cannot write it, or, you, or, or then you can either not write it as a contraction, or if you do write it as a contraction, you end up with an extra minus sign that you don't know what to do with. That doesn't agree with, with nature. But because that's zero, if the minus sign doesn't. No, but it's, it's zero in only one of the four terms. These are four terms, yes? So you get adding four numbers, and only one of them gets possibly a, a minus sign. And that, that oh, yeah. minus sign in four terms, you can't cancel away against the overall zero. Yeah, sure. So the fact that we have proven that it's a four vector and that it's covariant means that you don't have to worry about spurious minus signs. Nature has already taken care of these things. So it's downstairs here. All right. So. The only thing I've done now is taking the continuity equation, the statement that charge is A conserved and B does not teleport, and I've written it as a contraction. Good. So far, just notation. Now physics. Um, zero. Is that invariant? Yes. yes. You, have, you have no chocolate bars in one coordinate system, you move to another coordinate system, you still have zero chocolate bars, right? Okay, so this is invariant. Is this invariant? It is, by yes. definition. No, well, it, it, if you didn't know yet that J mu was invariant. Oh, excuse me, that, that, if you didn't know that this was a four vector, remember we oh. were proving that this was a four vector, we cannot assume that it is. Okay. Right? I mean, I wanted to assume it and then move on, but when Nelson came in, then he <laughs> said it's a four vector because he's right. So let's not assume that it's a four vector. Let's just say it is indeed a column of four functions. And this column of four functions you can write as such. But you do know that if you take this column of four functions and you contract it with something that you know is a four vector, and you also know that the outcome is invariant, then this must have been a four vector itself. 
if it's so important, I'm going to let you parse this for a second. One more time. If JMU had not been a four vector, right? We're not assuming that it is. If it had not been a four vector, mm -hmm. you can you can write you can write down something like this, be equal to that. Yeah. And you would have gotten a number. But if J had not been a four vector, then that number of that you came, that got out of this contra uh, uh, contraction would not have been the same in all quarter systems. Agreed? How can we say that? Like how can we be sure that because we Let's imagine that there is a column of vector whatever that yes. randomly just when the and it is at this point. Yeah, uh, but that could yeah. randomly like when multiplied by a uh, a four vector give uh, when contracting by four vector yes. give also a, like a yeah, an invariant solution like number. I don't see why like which mathematical uh, property makes sense that it's only a four vector that can like if. We need a, a very strict definition that said that only if. Uh, okay, I see the point. All right. Uh, let me. Uh, th there's nuance there, but let me first re restate the the argumentation. Yes, and then there are some nuance there that you're completely right about. But let's, let's uh, let me get back to that, that in a second. Liz, did you also want to say? Anything? Yes. Why can you be sure that zero is necessarily invariant? Because couldn't it be that if I observe a certain observable in my observer frame, I measure the value to be zero, but you measure a different value? Mm. Um, no, that is that was a little bit too fast, I guess. I mean, and my point was, well, if it's zero in one frame, it must be zero in all frames. That's, there are certainly there are exceptions to the rule. Right? You can have some observable that is zero in one frame, but if you do, you do go to some other guy's quarter frame, it's not zero anymore. Mm. So maybe I have to be a little bit more strict. Uh, this zero that comes out. So l let me rephrase. The fact that it's zero does not necessarily make it invariant. Zeros themselves are not necessarily invariant. Okay, good, all right. So I want to give you a quick chocolate bar e example that chocolate bars are not, you know, don't end up with extra chocolate bars are going to another order system. That is certainly true. But there is a chocolate bar here that is called charge. This zero. Uh, the fact that you see zero here is a direct result of the continuity equation. Now, I expect the continuity equation to hold in all coordinate systems. I do not expect that if you go to one coordinate system, charge is conserved, and you go to some other guy's coordinate system, all of a sudden charge is not conserved anymore. The amount of charge might be different from one frame to another, but this equation that it obeys, I expect it to be to hold in all coordinate systems. If this zero is not invariant, it's the, it's, it's a zero that it happens to be a non-invariant zero, then, then, then you're saying that there are coordinate systems in which charges can teleport or even not be conserved at all. So I'm making the physical assumption here that this continuity equation is true in all coordinate systems. That nature does not, has not chosen only one or two coordinate systems in which charge is conserved and the other ones it isn't. So it, it's, if you will, it's a physical, uh, assumption that I make here. And one that you can easily test in the laboratory, of course, right? Now, that means, going back to my original argument, that this is an invariant. That zero is an invariant. This is point, not every zero is necessarily invariant, true, this one is. Um, so I end up with something that's invariant. So I've written down a contraction. <coughs> I know that the outcome is invariant. I know that this thing is a four vector. Then it could be. Then this must be a four vector. Yes, I know you're you're correct. But so are we all parsing this statement here? Yes. The outcome is an invariant. It's a contraction of one of them is a four vector, and because contraction of two four vectors are invariant, therefore the other thing must also have been a four vector. That's the argument. Your question is: wait a minute, what we have proven in the tutorial is that if you know that two things are two four vectors, that then their contraction is invariant. Two four vectors, big arrow, a contraction two four vectors, the big arrow gives you invariant. I'm now making the opposite statement. You have an invariant, arrow back, then therefore contraction must have been two four vectors. That is your question, right? Is it necessarily true that if you have an invariant and a contraction of one of them is a four vector that the other one is necessarily also a four vector. The opposite way of arguing is true. If you know that there are four vectors, then the contraction is invariant. Does it also work the other way? The answer is yes. 
couldn't be a scalar? Uh, no, you can't make a contractual scalar. But you can multiply a four vector by a scalar. That is true. But that, oh, that's not a contraction. No. And how do we know, like, you have... We haven't proven that part. It has been, it has been proven. It, it, we haven't proven it. Uh, no, we but it has been. been it's, in fact, you can easily do this on your rainy Sunday afternoon. It's not hard. Uh, in fact, maybe if you think about it right now, you can maybe come up with a good reason why that works. I'm tempted, but let's not. Okay. So um, we'll go with the argument. Again, it's correct, even though there's this one nuance that we haven't fully proved. But again, feel free to try this on your own. It's not very hard. Again, this invariant. It's a contraction of which this is a four vector, then this must have been a four vector. There you go. Conclusion, this thing is a four vector. That's a huge conclusion, by the way, because of all the good things that we talked about. Contractions look for things in a world where everything changes from one quarter system to the other, it looks for things that do not change. Those are the ones you want to calculate with. You don't have to worry about which quarter frame and the numbers change. Look for the contractions. We have now an extra thing to take on the contractions with. So without even knowing what I'm writing down, I can immediately say, oh, look, but that means this invariant, right? If P is my energy momentum four vector. You know, here's another one. P mu alpha dx alpha is invariant. Now, come up with any combination that you want. All of them are going to be invariants. So we have this extra thing that we can now use to take these equations that are themselves not the invariant in, in their totality. The structure is, but not the full equation. We can turn these now into the invariant statements. Because, I want to thank you again for borrowing uh, a nice beautiful color. Do you see your four vector there? Yes. All right. So I'm, 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 I'm really hoping that once we've written this down, I will hear gasps of, of, of beauty, yes? Mm -hmm. yeah. Because look, let me write it down very specifically. There we go. You will not gasp before I'm done, OK? <laughs> Now, again, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to switch now exclusively to units for CS1. Um, it's just for notational uh, easiness. Now, you know that CS1, you know that this is true, yes? And if you're going to say I'm going to choose units where this is 1, you have that choice to do this. That means you also have the choice to take epsilon 0 and mu 0 to be 1. Okay, you can easily put the C's back in later. But for my argument, things get too messy if I'm not going to haul around all these epsilon zeros and mu zeros and C. So I'm going to switch now for this. That means, for all practical purposes, it's this. I haven't changed any physics, no approximations, just adopted the new coordinate system. Now, this is a four vector. Agreed. Uh, yeah, oh, can I, oh, yeah, I see it. Yeah. Here, G mu. How is this? These themselves are invariant, yes. All right. So what does it tell you about these two things? They're also a four vector. Well, let's tentatively call this a mu. Right. Where a mu being this. But I don't understand because those are two separate equations. Yes. So and we're going to group them together into one. Yeah. I mean, we already know that these belong to each other as a four vector. But why does that necessarily mean that the others would be related in that way? We're not, we're not done with the argument yet. Okay. We're on our way. <laughs> so let's, I mean, this might go, say, tentatively. Is there another syllable in there? Tentatively. Tentatively. Thank you. Okay, tentatively. <laughs> let's call, tentatively call this a mu. Right. Right? So then you would get something like this. Agreed? If I group these together into one equation. Yeah? By the way, there's still four equations. This was one, this was three. But with these mu's, it's still 0, 1, 2, 3. It's, it's the same four <coughs> equations. Now, this is a four vector. 
these two things don't, don't even start to care in what coordinate systems you are. Then what mathematically must this thing have been? If this doesn't transform from one coordinate system to the other, this one does according to a four vector in order for left side, uh, left hand side, right hand side to be the same thing. How must this change from one coordinate system to the other? As a four vector. As a four vector. There's literally no other choice, right? So I don't see how you can just combine two equations like that. You can just choose a different <coughs> right? Is this the definition? Yeah. Yeah. You make the assumption that G U was true, and then you see if it fits the equations. When you just circle a row and J and say that's a four vector when one is in the context of one equation. It's, it's sure. fine. I mean, you can combine them as long as you, you can combine these two, as long as you combine these as well, right? Okay. You can put any two equations into two vectors right. and put an equal sign in between them, right? And that doesn't make Because you say the first, the first index is the, the same as the first index there. But you don't relate them to the second index, right? It's still two separate equations. Yeah. Yeah. How about this? I have two equations here. And for some reason, I decide that these two become a factor. Okay. Well, that's fine. Cool. And this. You, see, you have the same information, just in a different sure. mathematical notation. That's what I do here. But I do a little bit of extra here. Again, just rephrasing my, my argument now. Uh, this thing, so if, if I do this, yes? Up to this point, I haven't really done anything. I've just taken these four equations, squeezed them together, and put this tentatively called a mu in there. And now I make the following observation. This is a four vector. We proved that. Um, this thing, so this thing uh, 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 transforms according to a Lorentz transform. This thing doesn't transform to, uh, uh, to if you go to one other coordinate system. That stays exactly the same. But if this transforms according to a Lorentz transform, this whole left-hand side must also transform according to a Lorentz transform. Agreed? If right-hand side transforms according to Lorentz transforms, then the whole of left-hand side should as well. Yes? Otherwise, it could not be equal. Now, left-hand side consists of two parts, Lambertian and this other thingy. The Lambertian is not the thing that will make things transform as, as Lorentz transforms, because the Lambertian itself is a contraction and therefore is invariant. So we know that the whole left hand side should transform as a Lorentz transform, but the Lorentz transforminus could not come from this part. And there's only one option left. A mu is itself a four vector. I literally have a head goosebumps in my neck now. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not joking. This is, this is how beautiful that is. Isn't that a bit ghetto mathematics? What's it? Ghetto mathematics. When you say one thing transforms in such a way is equal to something else, then that other thing must also transform in that way. Yes. How's it ghetto mathematics? <laughs> 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 I mean, you know something is the other thing, but then it transforms in the same way. It can be some other thing because the one of the two sides has two components, maybe their combination can only transform in this way or something. Yeah, by two components, you mean this thing and that thing? Yeah. Yeah, but this thing doesn't transform at all, does it? It's invariant. Okay. So you're right. I mean, no, listen, you're completely right. Here's, here's some Gatham mathematics, yes? <laughs> Six is x plus y. Okay? Then x is two and uh, y is four. Agreed? Gatho mathematics. It's, 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 it's true, but it's certainly not, you can certainly not fully conclude that this is the full solution. Mm -hmm. Agreed? Okay. Here's some non ghetto mathematics. Uh, this is one. Something like this. Now you can solve this uniquely. Agreed? I have a little bit of extra information in there. Mm -hmm. And the extra information made sure that the get the get on this oh, yeah. moved away. Uh, if you have the, the system of those two equations, yes. I thought just the second equation. No, 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 no. Then you can, yeah. Yes. By making the fact that uh, the Lambertian is invariant, you fix your value. We have the second equation. Yes. It's like we fix uh, x, the value of x, then we can find the value of y. Okay. Loosely speaking, I added some more information. Yeah. Okay, let, let me. Just make the same argument one more time in a somewhat different way. Alright, so 
suppose that I would write this. I define this new Z thingy. I'm not saying that it's a four vector. This new Z thingy, yes. And I, 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 I define it as being equal to this. All right. And I know that this J is a four vector. Do you agree with this? That this must be a four vector itself. Yes? No depth of mathematics there, right? All right. Now, now I'm going to say no, but I'm going to multiply this by four. Conclusion, well, Z is still a four vector. It, it, it's, it's scaled by a different number, right? Mm -hmm. It's still a four vector. And you know what? I'm going to put this in front. I shouldn't use mu because it's already been taken. Let's go with alpha. Here. But now you're contracting something, and before you were just multiplying by a scalar, yes. which is no contraction. No, but that's 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 it's not, not, the that, that's not the issue. The issue is that its transformation properties are not changed by adding something that does not itself transform. Um, that, that's the argument. Yeah. And and the thing is, only four vectors can transform these four vectors, right? Sorry. Only four vectors can transform these four vectors. Yes, by definition, yes. Right. So. This was uh, yet again an attempt to explain the same point. That is, this is extremely non-ghetto-like true. If this is a four vector, then whatever this is, it must be a four vector. Now, I'm going to put something in front that changes what this thing, exact, how this thing exactly looks. But the thing that I've added in front is not changing the transformation properties. Mm -hmm. Because itself, itself, this thing that I put in front is, is itself not changing from a four vector system. So that means whatever Lorentz transform this is in J can only still be in Z, even if I put this derivatives in front. That was the point that was missing. Okay, well, there we go. So, um, All right, that's okay, so we are in a very beautiful, beautiful situation right now. Because we now have a situation where our two equations here, of which we already knew that the structure itself, the derivatives, we're going to be the same all the coordinate systems. We also know something about the sources and the solutions, how they change from going to one coordinate system. And that means that we are now in a situation where we can group these two equations together. These two, well, it's really four, but you know what I mean. It's these two, group them together, turn them into one equation. Here it is. One version of this new thing that we now know is indeed a four vector equals a minus j mu. Here's all of electrodynamics in one equation. Yes, okay, four. Beautifully written as if it's only one. With with the important conclusion that we know how this transforms, we know how this transforms, and we know that the structure does not transform. I mean, this is really as relativistic as you can make a theory. The structure doesn't change. And the things that do change, change according to relativistic rules. Again, restating the point, we did not build this in. We did not, did not make a theory that way. It came out. It was already in there, but it was very hard to see on a E and B basis when you still know the, the Maxwell's equation. Now it's completely clear. Oh, yes. Is, is, this, only, sorry, is this only true when both, if you define both A and U and J and U as covariant form vectors? Uh, it's contravariant. Sorry, contravariant. Yes. yes. So if they were both covariant, it's, it's fine too because you know. As long as they're the same. No, let, let's do let's do a little bit of uh, uh, gymnastics here, okay? Suppose that for some reason, no idea why, but suppose for some reason you want to have this equation, and you want to write it as a covariant version of the same equation. So that means you want to have this have this mu downstairs. You want to have this mu downstairs. Now how do you, if you know that this is a four vector, we now know that it is, and you know that this is a four vector. How do you get mu's to go down? How will you multiply by the metric tensor? Uh, not multiply them. Sorry, contract okay. the metric tensor. <laughs> right. Okay, so yes. help me here. All right, so tell me, tell me, tell me. Uh, eta mu nu. Uh, yes. Uh, a mu. Uh, not mu, because you're contracting it with a mu. Mu, okay. So this, this thing is exactly, uh, oh, uh, that, that's not this. I mean, this will give you this. Yeah. All right, yeah. good. All right, so. Well, OK, I, I see that if you do that on both sides, then it wouldn't change. No, you have to be a little bit careful, though. You have to be a little, I mean, yes, I mean, it is true. But there's one subtlety to maybe point out. Okay. 
and that is that you want to get this thing down, that thing down, and that means that you have to take the contraction of the left side, left hand side, and the right hand side with indeed the metric tensor. Yes. So that will give you uh, this box squared. We would have this, yes, it's the same equation with an eta contraction with eta mu nu on both sides. Uh, this certainly, by the fact that this is a four vector and by the definition of a covariant four vector, this will become uh, mu. Yeah. Okay. How okay. about this side? Because you want to operate this thing, yeah. contract it on, on the that thing, but there is yeah. a Lambertian in, in, in between. Mm -hmm. that, that, that was the, the small subtlety we have to think but about. But can't you just take the Lambertian out? Yes, yes you can, but why? It's invariant. Not because it's invariant. The derivatives. It's just a scalar. It's, it's, just, it's, just, uh, it's not a four factor itself, right? That's, that's not. No, uh, no <coughs> but that's, that's not so much the point. It's not a part of the contraction, right? That's also not the point. <laughs> Look, these are derivatives, yes? Is it because it's communicate, uh, communicative? Like if we, we look at the contraction, we see that if we do it on one side or on the other, it doesn't uh, change the definition of the uh, Lambertian. If we have yes. mu uh, to the down or mu upside down, it means that if we change the thing and starts, and if we are, we're looking for the one up upside, or if we were looking for the, the one downside, it will be exactly the same. Uh, are you giving me this? Uh, yes, that it won't change like because That's it's true. communicative. So. Yeah. No matter where, if we were trying to look for the contraction and look for an, uh, an, another like indices uh, upstairs or downstairs to see the contraction, it will be always the same. I like, agree, but that doesn't quite answer the question. Because uh, uh, the Lambertians like a derivative. It's not like it's literally it, a okay, derivative. Okay, it's a derivative, yes. and because the metric tensor only has constants in it, That's then it. you can. Metric tensor consists only of yeah. minus one and plus one since some zeros, and all of them do not feel derivatives. You can yeah. just, as constant, take it in and outside of derivatives. Okay, so that was a small subtlety. That here you are allowed to replace a contraction with a derivative, and that's certainly not always true, especially not in general relativity, where the, where the, the metric tensor could be wildly different, difficult functions that are not certainly not constants. So. What I'm writing down now has nothing to do with contractions per se or with corner systems. It's just mathematics and the fact that this particular metric tensor happens to be only consisting of constants. Now, now we're where we want to be because now we've taken this thing inside. This thing, by definition of a covariant, covariant vector, becomes this. And now we have succeeded in what we oh, excuse me, now we have succeeded in what we wanted. We have the same information, but now it's a covariant. So but if, what, no if one were up and one were down, it wouldn't work. No, then, the, then yeah. it, it mathematically doesn't make sense because then you're saying that the one side of the equation transforms along with the Lorentz with the tensor, the other one does not. And then that means they could not have been, been the same. Yeah. So, this all the dynamics, but this is only, this, this is where the fun starts. Because listen, you know how four vectors change on the corner transformations, right? By definition. So we started by finding or defining four vectors as thingies that transform according to Lorentz transforms. We did some beautiful manipulations. We find that apparently what we used to see as a separate scalar function, scalar uh, uh, potential in a vector potential separately now are glued together into this one new big thingy that we know is a four vector. So we know how a mu, which we now know is this, we know how this transforms from one coordinate system to the other. Agreed? That's something we never looked at before. All of this, all the uh, solving of, of, of for scalar potentials and vector potentials, we always did up to this point, given a coordinate system. We have never looked at how they look in another guy's coordinate system. right? All the exercises that we did was, well, we have this one guy, he looks at what the scalar potential is or the vector potential is. We have never looked at the other guy who happens to be walking along the same system. Yes? I don't know, maybe that's a bit of a misconception on my side, but I always mm -hmm. thought that you could see fields as an object that penetrate big 
basically all of space. So That's how can true. you talk about field in terms of different observer fields if actually it feels like they are just everywhere and every part is commuting sure with true. any other part? No, no disconnect there. That's completely true. Uh, how does that clash with what I just said? Or does it? I feel like you would have something like instant communication from one part to the other part if you had one huge object that yes. is everywhere in space. Now, well, uh, before we go into break, let's let's spend a couple of minutes thinking about this, yes? Mm -hmm. um, so basically the continuity equation would have to be there, I think. Um, I think that there is a little bit of misconception. Let's take one step back. Um, my statement here is that if you know what the scalar field looks like, the scalar potential, what the vector potential looks like for one guy, for that guy, the scalar potential and the vector potential permeates all space. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one guy happens to be looking at a, a little bit of charge, there you go. <laughs> and I'm checking how much scalar potential ends up in my position, how much vector potential, you know what, and I'm also going to measure it here, and I was going to measure it here, do this at all points in space, and I will find how much scalar potential, vector potential comes, emanates from that particular piece of charge over there. Yes? Okay. So, I'm hoping that this addresses your point in, in about that it should permeate all space. It does. Yeah. Now, so I know how much uh, scalar vector potential comes from him at every point in space. Now the other guy comes along, right, the primed observer, he walks by, he, he also sees the charge and he's going to check how much scalar potential or vector potential is going to be at He also checks at this point and at that point and at that point how much is there and he will find different numbers at different points. Mm -hmm. But still at all points in space, he can check that at all points in space. Oh, okay, so he just perceives the numbers as being different because he moves it yes. in a different mm -hmm. way that yes. I move. But so is there some kind of proper field reference where you are now? No, that's the whole thing about relativity. Every single observer is allowed to use the same rules of physics yeah. and, find, and find answers. Yes. And we already saw that the structure of the equation is allowed by any observer. So whether I'm standing still and measuring the amount of scalar field and uh, the vector field coming from him, or I'm the walking observer, both of us are allowed to use these equations. Now, so this, that was because the long version itself is invariant. Now the numbers that, that me and the walking guy are going to find for that amount of charge at any point, that, those numbers are going to be different. Yes, but now we have learned something else. Because we have concluded that this is a four vector, we know exactly how my measured numbers for the scalar field and vector field are going to be related to the walking guy's scalar field and vector field. Now this should not be surprising to you because uh, let's take you as an example again. So you're not a current, you're just an amount of charge. If I were the standing still guy and measuring at any point in space how much scalar potential and vector potential I would find, I would find uh, zero vector potential at any point, yes? Or another, uh, putting the uh, somewhat different phrasing for the same physics. There's no magnetic field if he and I are standing still with respect to each other, agreed? Only an electric field. Yet when I'm walking and I was the other guy, then all of a sudden I still see a little bit of charge, but I, in, on top of that I see a current now because he and I are moving. So all of a sudden in my frame he is a moving charge, so there's current. So in, on top of the electric field he also ends up, I also end up finding a magnetic field. So that means, speaking in potentials, that if I was a standing still guy and I would have measured the vector potential, I would have gotten zero at any point in space, and I would have gotten a certain amount of scalar potential at any point in space. If I were the walking guy, then all of a sudden I end up with some extra amount of uh, vector potential. So it's like space and time that some yes. vector potential gets warped into scalar potential yes. as you move at a certain That point. is exactly right. Okay. And still a couple of minutes extra. No, no, let's, let's have a break. But yes, the answer is yes. For the people who see a connection. But we already see one minute to say that it's important. Because space and time are a four vector. Yes. And then the potential. No, that, no that is very true. Okay, that is very true. Um, we, because we know it's a four vector, we know that we can transform a little bit of scalar field into a vector field. Mm -hmm. And we can change a little bit of vector field into a scalar field. That's what Lorentz transforms do. They take a little bit of the one and turn it into a little bit of the other. 
the Lord's transforming space and time told you, well, you take a little bit of this guy's durations and you get back a little bit of this guy's uh, 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 distances. The f so we already knew that from special relativity about distances and durations in space and time. We now have found, and this is why it's such a big conclusion, such a mathematical exercise, there's a big physical conclusion here. You find here that you, by going from one guy's coordinates to the other, you can swap a little bit of scalar potential and get back a little bit of vector potential. And again, this is not surprising, because, again, no vector potential, only scalar potential, but wait a minute, I have a vector potential now. I've taken a little bit of the standing still guy's scalar potential, went to another coordinate system, and I got back, I swapped a little bit of scalar potential and got back a vector potential. Is it true for every fundamental force or something like that, that we can find a four vector for? No, uh, you have to be careful with these things. Um, what I think, but this is, this is where Jakob should come in at some point, I think. It's certainly a good question to ask him next week, because he's going to talk about how these series are embedded in the bigger field of particle physics. So I could probably say a couple of things about gluons that I like cannot. For example, gravity. Oh, no, gravity I do know a lot. So, um, uh, yes, that happens, that happens there as well. But in gravity, things are a little bit more complicated, because they're the starting expression are not four vectors. They're themselves tensors. It's curvature of space time. So you can take a little bit of one guy's curvature and turn it into, into an extra bit of curvature by going to one or the other guy's corner frame. But anyway, so but so I think the bigger question is, can every theory be written in a four vectory way that you can really tell how much of the one is being turned into the other? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, but maybe Jaco, if he were here, would say no, except for this particular thing. Is it the, the same car. thing that we, to, what we talk about, like in relativity, about symmetry or something like that? If we have a particular change somewhere, that it must have, like, in a, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. To have a change in something, you need, a, like, a, you know, kind of an opposite change no, in another exactly thing, yeah, like something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the M E N, I think it was, like, yeah. Or something like that when you talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I, we can immediately write it down. And again, yes, the then break and such. But, but, you <laughs> but because you said that everything could be written as a Lagrangian also. Like uh, yes, but now you're connecting too many things to unpack at once. So let's, let's start with the original one, yes? So the question is, okay, if you do get a little bit of scalar potential and it turn into a vector potential, just when moving to another guy's corner system, again, it's physically expected because all of a sudden you end up with a magnetic field that you didn't have before. Okay, so physically it makes sense, and now you see how it's mathematically done. Now, this is invariant. Agreed? Mm -hmm. This contraction of two four vectors. In fact, we can immediately write it down. It will be this. Agreed? And this is invariant. Do you agree so far? All right. Let's go to this example one more time. So Thomas and a certain amount of charge. I'm measuring how much uh, uh, scalar potential I feel, and I will get a certain number. How much vector potential will I feel be, being here now? No relative motion between the two of us. Zero. Zero. Okay. Now, so uh, let's suppose <coughs> that this number was four. Okay. Then I would end up with minus 16. Right? But because it's invariant, the same expression should also hold some other guy's coordinate system, and the outcome should still be minus 16. Agreed? Yeah. All right, now I'm the walking guy. Now, we cannot do the numbers at this point, but will my A be zero at this point if I'm the walking guy? No. no? I will get some number, yes? I have no idea what the number is, but one thing I do know, that if the number, the, out, the total outcome should still be minus 16, and this has now gone from zero to some other number, I will have lost a little bit of, of uh, scalar potential. And this is, uh, Vladimir, I think that you meant. Special relativity of the same thing in space and time. If the proper time must be the same, and you have lost a little bit of space, then you have gained a little bit of time. Same thing here. All right, so now it's time for a break. But then the, the real beauty starts, because then we're going to see how things transform. <laughs> Dark energy the same as dark energy. Thank you. 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 Th
There's people who really want to do something. Imagine, imagine. Because uh, you're wanting to talk about the back management from Parker Fairfax. It's certainly not a good thing. It's a good thing. Free of charge whenever you have a good thing. Yes. 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 The biggest embarrassment is the biggest embarrassment is the biggest embarrassment is the biggest the Yes, so it's, it's the biggest embarrassment in physics. So yes, cosmology says there should be, mm -hmm. or the expansion of the universe says there should be vacuum energy. You can yeah. calculate what the number is based on the observation of the expansion of the universe. We also know from particle physics that there's vacuum energy. You calculate these two numbers and you'll find that there's 10 with 100 zeros, order of magnitude difference between the two. So do you think, your personal opinion that they are just two completely different concepts or that we are just missing out big time? Um, I, what I think, but then again, it's just a hunch. What do I know? Measurements have to tell us. But uh, what I think is that we are applying, the reason that we get dark energy as a concept in general relativity mm -hmm. is by assuming that general relativity is correct on cosmological scales. Okay. And that is, might be true. Yeah. But you know, the last time that we scaled up gravity, mm -hmm from Newtonian gravity to somewhat bigger or smaller, then all of a sudden the rules were very different indeed. And that Newtonian gravity was only a special case of the bigger theory of gravity. So it could be the general relativity is only a special case of a bigger theory, and that the bigger theory doesn't need any dark energy. I see that. But then, sorry, I lost my point now. Can you please repeat what you said just before? Uh -huh. Yes, that um, uh, every time that you scale up a theory yes. in physics, or uh, if, you know, the, the number of times that, we, that, that physicists have done this in, in the history of physics, mm -hmm. every time that they scale up a theory or scale it down, all of a sudden the rules completely change, and we okay. found that what we thought was this theory is only a special case of a bigger underlying theory. Okay, but then for the last upscaling that we had, for example, when we went from Newton to Einstein, we had yes. observations of things that clashed with our Newtonian theory. For example, we had gravitational lensing that couldn't be explained, or the precession of the perihelion of Mercury or something yes. like that. And these we could then afterwards explain by applying the laws of general relativity. Yes. But at the moment, do we still have any observations related to gravity, not unification, not that well, clash with general well, relativity? Well, we do. I mean, we, we uh, it depends a little bit on who you ask, of course. but. There, there is a clash that is well known. And that is a clash that um, with a, uh, a, a positive uh, equation of state between uh, density and pressure in general relativity. Mm -hmm. I get the decision. No, that's where you have a minus. Ah. But uh, so if, if the, the energy density is, is uh, positively proportional to the pressure, then you cannot end up with an accelerated expanding universe. Stuff when you get the big crunch thing at the end? Uh, no, it depends how much of the stuff there is. Okay. There's something that's called the, the critical uh, density, and it's given by 3 over 8 times g c squared, something like that. A being uh, the expansion uh, Yes. Um, so you don't necessarily get, get a big crunch just because you don't have dark, dark energy. You can okay. still have an eternally expanding universe uh, without having to invoke dark energy or something like that. But that universe would e be eternally expanding, but the expansion rate would slow down. Okay. And dark energy, uh, but I if, if you want to have a universe that um, not only accelerates, uh, excuse me, not only expands eternally, but also does it in an accelerated fashion, or it's a less strong statement that it doesn't slow down, and you want to do this within general relativity, then you need an equation of state, a relationship between density and pressure, that uh, is that is a negative number. In fact, it's being very specific. And what you need is that the amount of energy density in the universe is smaller than one third minus one third of the pressure of the universe. If this is the case, 
then you end up with an accelerated university if you assume gender identity. My problem is with uh, getting a universe that slows down is because the universe is expanding at a finite speed. Yes. Is that true? So uh, if you slow down that speed, if you reduce a finite number, at some point you will get zero, right? And then it will be stagnant. No, you can you, you can get negative numbers from that. But then it would contract again. Yes. So would you or if you slow down exponentially? Yeah, I mean, there's the, the, if, if we forget about the dark energy option, if you forget about this condition, by the way, this is the clash that I was talking about, yeah. because this assumes that either pressure or energy density of the universe, or that there is stuff in there that has either negative pressure or negative density, and that doesn't agree with classical physics. No. Okay, so the, here is a clash. So you were asking about, well, the last time we did that we scaled up our rules of physics was because there was a clash somewhere. Well, a very clear, clear, clear clash here. And some people say, well, there's no clash. This stuff exists. We just haven't found it yet. And some people some say, no, there is a clash. This stuff does not exist. It's just the theory of gravity is not correct as cosmological scales. Okay. So the first group of people say, if you upscale general relativity, which you're perfectly fine. You can still use general relativity. It's just some new component comes in. And the second group of people say, you simply cannot upscale general relativity because you end up in, in a new theory altogether. And there's really two camps in cosmology in that sense. Most people go with the dark energy one, but general relativity is correct. It's definitely a lot nicer for physics. Yeah, uh, it's more you know satisfying yeah. for the people who are working with general relativity, That's I guess. Th that it is a correct theory. Yeah. yeah. And it's always like that. It's like you're the engineers of um, 200 years, because you're just working with the yeah. stuff that we have in reality. But then again, is it? I mean, it, 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 it's, it's well, part of this is just a, a matter of taste. Uh, to me, it's, it's somewhat distasteful that in order to save this one particular theory, I have to come up with yeah. all, all kinds of ad hoc extra no, types of it's materials. Not, not beautiful in that sense. No. Yeah, it's like ether, like before yeah. light yeah. and those kind of things. Yes. Yes. Like it's always the same. Like when you come up with something that is a bit that still yes. holds, but is no, that is a good example. In, in order to save what people perceived was the correct theory of, of, uh, of, of uh, space and time. Right, just uh, Galilean, Newtonian space and time rules. In order to save that, you have to invoke this ad hoc thingy that was called the ether. And then it turned out, no, 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 wait a minute. Actually, if you come up with this underlying theory of space, this new spirit of space and time, you don't need this ex this extra made up stuff. And in, in a particular way of looking at it, that is that is more beautiful. Aren't you kind of hitting a roof when it comes to what you can measure experimentally, though? Because what you can measure, like the general relativity that you measure experimentally, um, that's really depends on like um, I don't know the complete physics, but it depends on very small increments that small yes. arrows can make large noise, for example. Yes. Aren't you kind of hitting a roof when it gets to like if you want to prove this bigger theory experimentally? Yeah, yeah. Experimentally. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think so. That there's a pragmatic issue there, maybe, that at some point, maybe it's just, in principle, it, it's possible, but not in practice. Right? I mean, I heard Jacques talk in, in the, uh, the Observant a couple of weeks ago. He had this article, I don't know if you saw it, but. Um, yeah, sorry, it's useless, right? Sorry, what? It's but the article where people turned his words around. Oh, and yeah, he, said that he so hated didn't that. Find yeah, yeah. yeah, I was not happy with that at all. No. <laughs> so his words were misinterpreted. Uh, there was this article where they ask uh, scientists from, from UM in different fields, every week there's an episode or so, what they would do with a huge bag of money. And uh, they asked Jacob a couple of weeks ago, and he said, well, I would really like to understand effects such and such and such. In order to do that, here's the practical impossibility, you would need a particle accelerator that was, I forget what it was, but it's, it's, you know, the, the circumference of the Earth or something like that. Yes, in principle it's possible, in practice probably not. Um, and that might be the roof, a pragmatic roof that mm. you run But maybe into. there is other way also, like... Yeah. No, true, maybe. I mean, the neutron star thing is a, is a beautiful thing. Uh, like, yeah. indirect measure, like, that come without using, like, a direct yeah, real yeah, exactly. strength, and you can find few, like, yeah, intermediate means. Mm, of course, I mean, the universe, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, crashes particles into each other, protons and such, and energies that we... S we would never be able to build on Earth, even if we did build this 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 you know, forty thousand kilometer circumference particle accelerator. 
and neutron stars is, is where these things happen, you know, just for free. Because gravity attracts these things to a huge degree, and, and this is one of the reasons that people in gravitation wave physics are so interested in neutron stars, because they hope to get from the gravitation waves to learn something about how particles crash at energies that could never be, be done on Earth. So you're right, there might be, you know, ways around doing this. So that there is a roof in, in the current path of methodology, of practical, of experimental methodology, but maybe new avenues open. I, I, know, I don't think that there is a roof in science. There is always be like something, like it's... I mean like an experimental roof, literally in the measurement. Yeah, but even in the measurement. Like I mean, string theory, theory you can really difficult, difficultly... But improve. I think it's like the question with the curve. Like, and you have like two things. Either you overfit the curve, either you approach it like you choose precision over overfitting. Mm -hmm. Like, I think it's always this. You you can always try to be as much as precise, as, you know, as sensible as you want, but you will lose like in uh, specificity. Well, it's kind of the same thing. Physical there's limits on how sensitive you can be just by the uncertainty equation. Exactly. Or for example, you have string theory as a theory of. I don't know, 11 or 12 dimensions or something like that, but you only operate in three dimensions, so you will never be able to do any measurements about the other yeah, the smaller dimensions the, that are For example, you can have between. projections or something like or things like that, you know? I don't know if you have... Yeah, but that, that measurement theoretical again. Yeah, but measurement does not have to be direct measures. It can be indirect things. So if you feel indirect effects, <coughs> you don't have to be... There, I don't see why there would be a limit then. No but, no, but it can be degeneracy there. That's, that's you do measure mm -hmm. an effect, but uh, the, 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 there's there's more than one theory that could explain that effect of satisfaction. Uh, I think there is probably there will always be like a hole that we would never fit in, yes. but we always can could get closer to. No, it. no, that, no. That's 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 a different problem. What I'm talking about is that you. Um, is that you are able to do the measurement, but the all the ten theories that explain these numbers. You cannot see which of the ten is to correct your mind. That's what string theory is doing right now, right? It's like explaining some stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's like really that. giving any direct um, <laughs> <laughs> opportunities. Yeah, yeah uh, that's true. Okay. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's always the same. It's like, like, there's always like confronting theories, and then you have like experiments that infer more. Yeah, yeah, yeah but there is what a problem. Like, there is no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As far as Jakob said, this is half of what. But as far as you can, can measure, you cannot measure any string theory in French yeah. directly. But I mean, yeah, yeah. but that's the point. You can have theories, and then it doesn't know. It's not because we don't have the proof of that this theory is wrong or it's right that we cannot work with it. Or uh, the country. And it's only experiment that will improve or disprove the theory. Uh, actually, but it, like in history, it's always the case. Like you have two theories, and they didn't have like any need to know which one was the correct one, unless they had like new knowledge or new measurements. But it's not only in terms of measurement; it's also in terms of new knowledge. You discover new phenomena that couldn't be explained by one, but could be explained by the other one. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's not only experimental in terms of measures, it's also what we can perceive different things. Like in nature, not only precision, precision but in nature, we will see phenomena that we've never heard about, and then that will bring new information. <laughs> Comic ones. Maybe not. Mm -hmm. Two guys, one of them says, I have this Good. brilliant idea. So I looked at the whole oh, okay. nature's made up of small vibrating strings. That's what one guy says. The other guy says, Oh, that sounds cool. What, do, what does that mean? And then the other guy says, I don't know. <laughs> Which, which, to you know, cynics, this is what string theory does. It has an idea, but they have no idea how it presents itself in nature. For the string theory, isn't it like the, that the guy won like a, a mathematical prize, not a physical prize? Oh, uh, the field medal. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, it was yeah. the field medal, but not like the Nobel Prize. So it's more of a beautiful mathematical model or whatever, like, yeah. Yeah, they were talking useful about thing, but we don't know if it's like in nature as, as per se. No, that's true. Ed Witten is, is who you're talking about. Uh, the thing is, there's an enormous amount of degeneracy there in string theory. Um, so you have these seven or so dimensions that, yeah, that, that you like obviously you are not there, but you need them in order to get gravity in in the right way, right? I mean, this is what the string theory say, that, that in order to the small amount of dimensions that you, that, that, that you, that you need in order to have both quantum field theory and uh, uh, general relativity in is, is 10 or so, whatever the number is, 
and say that, that means you have seven of them that you that obviously are not there. And then they say, well, that's because these numbers are very small, or these dimensions. So you could move in that direction. It's just so small that in practice you don't notice it. And then the question is, okay, but then in how many ways can you f make these seven extra dimensions roll up? Because you cannot just say they're cut off. You cannot say it was only one millimeter and then the dimension stops. So it has to curl back in on itself. But there's many ways that you can make things curl in on themselves. Is that a that, that, that's a manifolds, yes. And uh, some guy at Nikkev, when I was a master student, he was a PhD student, he did work on this and he found that the amount of number of Calabiaos, the way that you can fold up um, these, ten, uh, these, these seven extra dimensions, is 10 to the power 200 or some ridiculous number. Yeah, yeah, they found a lot of them yeah. already. Because in the beginning, I think they thought that there was only a few, but then yes. they found more and more and more. And yes. more. Yes. Originally, their hope was that there was only one way of doing this consistently and that that one way, indeed, Produce all the laws of physics, mm. but they found that uh, that there's 10 to the power 200. I forget what his name is. <laughs> Tim Dijkstra, or Tim Dijksman, or something like that. But anyway, he's so sort of the theory group at Nick in 2005 or so, and he found there was two, 10 to the power 200, and, and each and every single one of them came up with different rules of physics, and. Some single theory says, "Oh, look, but that means in the 10 to the power 200, there's certainly one that agrees with our universe." I said, but "Yeah, but it's." Uh, th yeah, that's that's true, mm -hmm. but it's like going to a yeah. But we can make like yeah any assumption, infinite sure. assumption, and say oh, but inside of this infinite assumption, there is the assumption, the correct assumption to build it's, the universe. It's, it's, it's like it's, it's, it's like going to a uh, to a uh, fortune teller, yeah. and then the lady with the crystal ball says, "Well, you're going to meet the love of your life next week, but it might also be the day after, or the day after. And you know what? It might also be yesterday. It might also not happen. It might also be. Uh, it might also happen twice. At some point, if you make 500 predictions, sure, some of them, one of them will be true. But it's, does that mean that you're you use the correct way to? So, anyway, So, so yeah, quote Feynman. So very quotable guy, he did, wasn't a big fan of now, string theory, he said, uh, string theory doesn't make predictions, it makes excuses. <laughs> <laughs> Do you yeah, like so string theory? No, I, 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 I know too little of it, okay. so I, I have no informed opinion. Anyway, so, um, let's move on. Excuses. So again, just to recap, we have now found one equation that describes all of uh, electrodynamics, we know the solutions, we know how everything is structured, we know how relativity is built in. So again, for the nth time this course, our job is done. But we can do a little better, because <laughs> we're not going to meddle too much anymore with this equation. I mean, this is as far as you can reduce this thing. At the beginning I said we're going to reduce everything to one equation, and then somebody said, oh, it's really four. Yes, okay, it's really four. But here they are, okay? So this is all the collector dynamics. Um, but since we now know that this thing is a four vector, we know how it transforms from one coordinate system to the next. This is all we were discussing before. And already had wavingly, we can understand that you can replace a little bit of scalar field and get back a little bit of uh, vector potential. How exactly? Well, this is an invariant. So if you have this thing, then it must have come at the cost of that thing. Which again is, is what you would expect based on your physics alone. But if you start moving with respect to something, then this thing that is responsible for your magnetic field should pop up, whereas at first it didn't, but because the outcome should be the same for all, that means you have uh, sacrificed a little bit of, of electric field, if you will. So the idea is let's make that specific. Let's find the rules of how electric and magnetic fields go from one system to the other. So we know exactly how the potentials do, yes? In fact, let's take that as our starting point. So suppose that somebody solves this equation, he finds his four numbers, where right? mu is four vectors, uh, it's four functions is what I meant. And I'm now going to introduce a guy who walks with constant velocity v with respect to the original guy, 
and we're interested in how he is going to see the scalar vector potential. So we're interested in getting A primed if we know A unprimed. Now, A primed is given by A prime zero, A prime one, A prime two, A prime three. Now, you help me. What do these look like in terms of the unprimed ones? This should be easy now, because we know it's a four vector. Lawrence transform. Yes, please. Yeah, gamma times uh, a zero plus minus 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 b divided by okay, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm going to skip a one. A one. Yes. A one. Okay. And then this one. Gamma a one. Minus B A zero. Okay. And these two? Sorry, this is the same. These are the same, yeah? Yes, here's of course where some notation might become confusing because it does not say A squared right? or A2. It just means X and Z. Okay. So, uh, this part is now new. We didn't know this before today. We now know this. Perfect. We know exactly how to calculate this stuff. And that's good. So, again, I can calculate is scalar potential vector potential in my moving frame or frame that moves with respect to the unprimed frame and I know exactly how to do this, so that's fine. But my question is, well, let's go back to our electric and magnetic fields and see how those transform. So my question now is, suppose that I measure EX. So, I'm uh, sorry, Tom, you're, you, you're my example uh, today. A little bit of charge, I measure a certain amount of electric field here. And then the other guy, the primed guy comes along, he moves with respect to me with velocity v, and I want to know how much electric field e, e x primed he measures. So the electric field in x direction of the guy moving with respect to the original guy. So my wish is, by the end of today, to have a dictionary to have e x primed written as the E's and B's of the unprimed person. So it's like a Lorentz transform, but now not for the potentials, but for the actual electromagnetic fields. Let's take a guess first. Do you think that they transform according to Lorentz transforms? Are the E fields and B fields themselves more uh, four vectors? If you were to take a guess. E fields. Mm. That would be good, right? I mean, you would get uh, gamma EX uh, minus B something ish. No, because you have the magnetic field is kind of empty when it starts to move, no? It's like the... Well, that's really the question now. I mean, you should, we should add something, but no, like, as it is, if we just leave E, because uh, we know that it changed, like, when it's in a dynamic case, it changed uh, in respect of uh, the magnetic field, so, yes. so by itself it cannot be a four vector. We need to I be agree. able to link E and B with the time, that. and then we could. Yes, that's a very physical argument, but it's very correct. Uh, the point that he's making is that if if, if 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 you were to write down the E electric field primed, the prime system, at the very least, you will have to include the magnetic fields, right? For the example that we just did, that if I start moving with respect to Tanda, all of a sudden I should, certainly should get an electric uh, magnetic field on top of my electric field. So some B should come in. So it's not that the E is transformed into other E's, and B is transformed into other E's, uh, B's. Uh, they should in some way mix. That's a very physical argument. Here's a more mathematical argument. I cannot make a four vector out of three E's. E, X, E, Y, E, Z, right? And same thing with my B's. So then, I'm, I'm, I'm just lacking components to put in four. We can say that one is in times of uh, time, maybe, no? Something like that. Yeah, but what, 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 what would that thing be? The, 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 the time part of the electric field? I mean. uh, a function that change, uh, and then you have no. The good thing is we don't have to think about it much, because we have all the rules. We know how these things change. We also know how to change vector potentials and scalar potentials into electromagnetic fields, E's and B's. So just combine these things together, right? So if I want to get my EX prime, let's first write it in the way that you 
uh, what writes an electric field in x direction in terms of potentials. Do you remember what that was? If you know your potentials, how do you get your e, your electric field? But, yeah, sure. So, this and something else as well. Minor time derivative of this, right? That would be for all three components again, right? Don't do that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah we have to be careful here before, we well, have to be careful just to be consistent. We're talking about the in x direction right now. Now, so that means that instead of uh, the gradient of the scalar field, as you know, is a vector of which is the, the x component is just dx the scalar field, and the white one is the dy of the scalar field, and z is the dz. So if we're going to restrict ourselves to x direction, then it will be this, all right? Yeah. And also, uh, if we're going to restrict ourselves to x direction, we need the x direction of the vector potential. So that's this thing, right? Mm -hmm. I'm doing, oh, and by the way, these are primes because it's in the prime frame. We're looking at how these things look in the prime frame. All right, so, okay, first step taken. There's a mistake here. I wonder if somebody sees it. Oh, it's in, uh, the, the derivative should be with respect to the primes. Yes. Of course. If, you go, if you're going to be in your frame and you're going to calculate your vector potential, scalar potential, you're going to take their derivatives, their derivatives with respect to your space and time. So these derivatives themselves come with little primes. All right, now. This is Ax the x component of the vector potential? Yes. Or is it the vector potential of the x component of the electric field? Or is that the same thing? It's the, the x component of the vector potential. Okay. Yes. So right. they translate directly to each other, component-wise? Yes, uh, the, the, these things do, yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay, now, um, okay, so we are now able to write our electric field in terms of our potentials, but this is not new, we already did this in the second week, so. But the question, of course, is, can we write this ultimately as E and B, possibly B, well, we're already just assuming that there's going to be a B in there, but let's see if it happens. Um, in terms of on prime suggestions how to do this. If we can link the... We know that the sigma prime and the um, potential vector, uh, the scalar, uh, sorry, the vector potential prime, um, we know that the relation between the two is going to, we have a similar uh, relation between the two uh, than the one in the unprimed frame. So uh, if we can find the relation between uh, delta x prime and uh, the scalar and the product potential, then we can find it for, it will be the same for the... Uh, it would be the same for the uh, unprimed frame. No? Yes, but are we doing extra work then? Because we already know how how a x prime can be expressed in a unprimed, right? And we already know how phi prime can be expressed in uh, how phi prime can be expressed in phi unprimed. Agreed. Mm. In, in fact, that's we'll just use a tr uh, yeah transformation. Yeah. 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 yeah, but we have two transformations to do. One transformation is this thing and that thing. We have to transform in uh, the on-prime versions. We know how to do this because we, in, before the break, we saw it's a four vector, so we know these rules. And secondly, there's, oh. Uh, ah, last one. Secondly, these have to be transformed into the on-prime ones. But we also know how to do that because we did the new tutorial. So we just have to fill in the transformed versions of the derivative and of the, uh, the potentials and just work out the result and then we end up with something hopefully beautiful. Now, maybe it's good to, for a moment, to remind ourselves what this looks like. One over C. Yeah, I'm uh, skipping the one over C, but. Uh, yeah, the D, D, X, D, Y, D, T, over each other. Uh, well, yes, that's certainly true. Uh, so this is the D, uh, 
C prime the X prime Y Z prime. Sure. How is it expressed in terms of on prime? It's, it's a four factor. We proved this. Uh, the upper part. So we just copy paste this. Just yeah, Ch just changing a zero with d t a u one d p. So will be this. Somebody wants to make a comment at this point. It's almost correct. We we lower transform this. That's correct. We showed in the tutorial that it is that it, that it is a four vector, so it does transform according to lower transform, but. Yes, yeah. not, not, not maybe. That was the whole thing that we proved, yes? Yeah. It was covariant. It transformed the other way. Uh, so plus. Yes. This was why it was so important that we did that exercise. Okay. So this 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 one here is a contravariant four vector that we showed in the tutorial that is a covariant one. And that matters. All right. Now uh, let's do the work. <coughs> um, yeah, let me write in green the transforms derivatives. First of all, uh, let's, let's do it like this. Okay, uh, can somebody uh, dictate the x primes? All the ingredients are on the board. So this, so the gamma we're taking out. Yeah, you know that, that gamma. Okay, and then you say this becomes. Uh, yeah, so it becomes dt of phi prime plus v dx of phi prime. Yeah. And dx will be dt. Uh, I think you start with the. Oh, sorry, I was looking at the at the time component. So it's gamma times dx of phi prime plus v times dt. Gamma times I really just write now. Uh, so let me first uh, Lorentz transform covariantly Lorentz transform the derivatives. Okay, so I'm just going to leave these as is then for now. All right, with a plus, yes. Yeah. That was this whole thing here. And then there is a DDT primed, and we also know how to do that. That also gives you a gamma. That gives you dt again with a plus v dx. So far so good, I think this is correct. Yep. I have one um, question because now you're also assuming that the individual components also transform by means of uh, Lorentz transforms. What do you mean by individual components? I mean ax and. Yeah, but this is what we saw here, right? It is what they do. Oh, that was the good news here. That's because we knew that J mu is a four vector, then their A mu is a four vector, so we know how they transform. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm using. So let's do that step now, by the way. So, okay, we have succeeded in rewriting our derivatives in terms of the on prime derivative. So, good news there. But there's the next step to make. So, I'm just going to copy now. All right, so these are just copy the green ones. I'm now going to transform the fields. Now those transform contravariantly, and that is according to these rules. So, you tell me. Well, you know, there's both of them, all of these things are going to get a gamma, so this gives you gamma squared everywhere, right? Okay. That, that's this gamma and that gamma. Yep. Five prime. How does that look in terms of unprimed uh, uh, potentials? Uh, as a phi minus v ax. Yes, that's uh, this one. A zero is phi. Yes. And this one, a x prime. How is that written in terms of unprimed? Okay, good. 
Why did you prime the yeah, there is no prime. That there should be no prime. Okay. Now, now we have to work this out. Hopefully, what we end up with is something that will be an expression in scalar and vector potentials. But no, now everything is written in the on primes, right? Yes. So completely done with the prime coordinates. Now everything is in primes, both the derivatives and the fields themselves. Hopefully, what we end up with is some expression in terms of derivatives and potentials, in which we then can recognize electric fields and magnetic fields again. So that ultimately, we end up with an expression that does not contain any potentials anymore, just electric and magnetic fields. Now, uh, there's, we don't have any choices. We just have to go through the maths. For these easy maths, gamma squared. I'm not going to bother with colors anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. I see. <laughs> Let's collect all terms and go with phi. Maybe that's a good idea. <coughs> Dx phi. And then there's a minus V dx ax. I'm just multiplying this out. And multiplying this out gives you plus V dt phi mean v squared dt ax. Is all this? Minus. And then do the rest as well. This minus uh, I put in front of the overall brackets. So it becomes a plus. I get dt ax. That's correct. And I get dt, there's a minus here, dt uh, Still correct? You have to check me, I'm doing this real time. Then v dx minus v dx by x. Uh, one minus? Oh, okay. uh, v dx is plus, no? Plus. plus, yes, this is this, thank you. And then there's a minus, and I think yeah. that's correct. Again, doing this real time, so feel free to check me. But I do see already a couple of things dropping out. Maybe V. Before you do it, I'm just wondering, I see that you took a lot of the Vs out mm -hmm. of the partial derivatives. Yes. How come? Uh, well, Especially on the time ones. No, that's true. But we were assuming that things are, that the two observers are moving with constant velocity with respect to each other. We don't have to, though. Yeah. You can make as complicated as you want, but I'm restricting myself to constant velocities. So V is strictly the velocity between the two Yes, observers. and we're assuming that nobody's starting running accelerated with respect to the other guy. Okay. okay, and if you remember from special relativity, it means that both of your observers are in inertial frames. If you go to non-inertial frames, uh, periods five of general relativity, then these become more complicated. Now, a couple of things are going to drop out. The uh, V, D, X, A, X terms and, and those, yeah. Anything else? Yeah, V, D, X, A, X. V, D, X. This one, that one yeah. against that one. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. And you know, light becomes even more beautiful. Because what I end up with here is I get a dx uh, phi mm -hmm. and uh, minus v squared dx phi. So if you want. That's that term. And that term, yes. And I think something similar will happen to the, these. Yeah, there yeah. you go. I get minus 1 minus v squared. Dt ax. Uh, this is a plus, I'm sorry. Dt ax. Agreed? So these two terms. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, should it be the opposites? Minus uh, v2 plus 1? No. In this minus is that minus, right? Yeah, but 1 is from the other side, no? Uh, I don't or know what you mean by other side. There's only operating on one side. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry uh, I think this is correct. No, 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 Somebody can check me here, but. It's because now yeah, the gamma cancels out with the 1 minus v. Yeah, that, that was my. That was my uh, this extra simplification because look people, if you remember, gamma is equal to one minus v over c squared. Well, we put c to one, right? This one will gamma once. 
power wall sensor mm -hmm. comes. And we have more of those. And they come squared. Squared, so you lose the square root. One minus v squared, numerator, mm -hmm. denominator mm -hmm. cancels this one. So that means ultimately this gamma and this and this gamma and this will cancel each other out and then just end up with dx pi minus b t a x. Do you remember possibly how to write this final expression back in terms of E fields, B fields? Everything is now written in terms of on prime coordinate systems. The fields are, the potentials, and the derivatives are. But the object was to write everything in terms of E fields and B fields. So it's the same as what we started with. Uh, yes. But then just for the on prime. So it took us a while, but apparently what we have found now is that, here's my example again, I'm measuring your electric field in x direction, and some other guy comes walking by in x direction and measures the electric field, he and I will measure the same electric field coming from top. So the EX field apparently does not change from one coordinate system to the other. Uh, yeah, you could say that EX is invariant, yes. Invariant is usually Sure, yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, it does not change from one coordinate system to the other. Agreed. But what about the magnetic field? Yeah, that's, uh, well, we have 10 minutes left. Let's, uh, because let's, that let's would, do one of the mechanics. That would be strange if, I agree. like, EX doesn't change, then... I agree. Proves in the pudding. So let's let's eat some pudding, which... Uh, so <laughs> still, uh, here, in the direction of X for a particular reason, can you do it for all space and little pieces? Oh, you know, yeah, I mean, I just happened to take this one because I knew that the answer was going to be particularly simple. But we have 10 minutes left, so you tell me which of the other either E directions or B directions you want to check. Let's try BX then. Yeah. Oh, no, no, in a per per particular one. You tell me, which one do you want? BY. Okay, so. Alright. So. Somebody. BY. Well, thank you. Okay. So let's do the BY here. Okay. Now, primed and the y is also primed, yes? Because we're starting with the magnetic field in y direction. Uh, now you tell me. So how do you write this in terms of potentials? Let's start there. But of that curl, which is itself a vector, you take its y direction, yes? But all of this is still in the primed y coordinate system. And this is also the prime one. Okay. Uh, fortunately, we know of a curl what it looks like in the y direction. If you take your definition of a curl, then you know that this is uh, zax minus xaz primed, 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 primed. Right? This is the y direction. Okay. So, we have very much the same exercise as we had before. We have to transform this, the derivatives, into the unprimed ones, and then we have to transform the vector fields, the unprimed ones. Let's see how far we get. Somebody dictate this for me. Well, what does dz become? Do the same thing. All right. Because in uh, size forms, x direction does not change anything to z. That's good. By the way, uh, we can also immediately write down that az prime is going to be az, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So we can already save ourselves quite some trouble here. Uh, I'll write it down in a second. How does this one change? Ax prime. Uh, sigma. Yeah, but sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then the AX. And then the other back to the H. Okay. This one, yeah? Okay. So that's this part minus DX. Let's write down the DX prime in terms of non prime derivatives. Gamma, delta X. Plus. Ah, very good. Plus. 
E. D T I D T. D T. Okay. And then this thing has to operate on A Z prime, but A Z prime is A Z is A Z itself. Right. So let's work out the results. Um, gamma goes out. I get D Z A X. That's this. Minus V D Z phi. You could kind of really see what's happening here. Minus gamma D X D Z. Minus V in gamma DT AZ. Is this correct? I think so, yeah? Yeah. All right. Can we make something beautiful out of this? I'm just checking for myself, I'm not making any mistakes. Fine. All right. I see some stuff that I can think I can write in terms of E fields and B fields already. Because what people, what I see here is gamma times dzAx minus dxAz. That's this term and that term. Is this look familiar, maybe? I mean, there's extra stuff coming, but let's focus on this first. It's, it's, curl. Curl. it's gamma times a curl, agreed? Yeah. yeah. Okay, but in which direction does the curl point? Y direction. Y direction, agreed. Okay, so. So it's B Y. It's B Y. Something interesting is happening here, by the way. It means the that same. if I were to measure the magnetic field now coming from Tom, you now also become a magnet, and I start walking with respect to him. I still have a magnetic field, but I get an extra amount of magnetic field pointing in a different direction. This is, this is the Lorentz force, by the way. But no, it's pointing in the same way. Oh, yeah, multiply by. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, no, yeah, sure. I mean, the, yeah. sorry, the but amount has changed. The, the direction, the direction is, still is the same. But I still have some extra stuff floating around. That is this minus gamma V delta Z phi. And what else is there? Plus. Plus, I'm surprised. Uh, I'm surprised. No, it's minus. It's because you you just reuted the minus sign. Yeah. So it's uh, it's still a minus. So this is a minus. Yes. Good. Okay. I was getting confused there for a moment. Uh, gamma V D T A Z. But you know what? Yeah, isn't that the E Z E field in the Z direction? Yeah, you're right. Minus um, uh, sorry, I'm just being I'm just being sloppy here. Uh, this is the one that I need. So that's uh, V that's D Z phi with a minus. Minus, that's this one. Gives you D T A Z. Yeah. Do you recognize this as maybe as something electrical like that? That's E Z. That's E Z, yes. So apparently, uh, minus plus. So how does my magnetic field change if I go from one quarter system to the other? I gain electric field. Again, it's expected, yes? You start moving with respect to something, then all of a sudden it appears as if you see something else. But I also gain uh, electric field. Now people um, are very happy that we also got at least one of the magnetics. Uh, there's how many more of these? Four more, yes? Yeah. Now, um, you can easily work this out for yourself. So what is the plan? Um, there's a couple of exercises. Some of them have to do with uh, the contraction notation. Just a couple of things for you to think about. And there are a couple of exercises where you have to apply this. And certainly, you have to find what the remaining four are. And I really advise you to go through this exercise. Yes, really try to do this. You're not along with this as if you had not already done the course. But uh, Adres is also going to make this exercise. And um, 
so to wrap up, I will have the uh, recordings uh, uploaded by tonight, including uh, the exercises and uh, a synopsis. Are there any questions at this point? No? I think in week three I asked you to like, write in one equation all of electrodynamics, and you did, but we didn't understand the contraction of the point. Okay, so what was it again? That's, oh, that's yeah, yeah, but that's this one. Uh, yeah, that's this one. Oh, yeah. Still didn't get there. No, is that the, <laughs> no, but this, no, but th this is the part that Jocko uh, will do. As you know, uh, next week Jocko's going to take off, he's going to embed everything, and what Jocko is going to do, he's going to write all of this into this final form. Again, it's just a rewrite of this. There's no extra... The first of all, there's no extra physics, but it does, there's not even more clarity in there. I hope that I showed you how much relativity is in here. Um, this will this will, will not do when it does this. The only thing that this does for you is write all of this in terms of this one big tensor. It's the Maxwell tensor. And the reason that Jock is going to do this is because he's going to show you how this F mu nu, which contains all of this, including all the relativity, all the contraction and everything, how that is embedded in his theories of particle physics. And we already briefly discussed one of them when I asked you, tell me one term in Jacobus Lagrangian, and people said it's the contraction of F mu nu with F mu nu itself. You now know, even if you don't know what F mu nu is, that the thing, that big contraction of F mu nu with another F mu nu, is invariant. And that's what Jaco wants. Because in his theories of particle physics, he really does not want to worry about whether his theories are applied in one coordinate system or the next. So, Jacob will explain that one. Oh, I'm sorry, that, that part is his. Okay? So, that was it for today. Thank you. I didn't get a gas, by the way. I was hoping for a gas. So, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Very sarcastic gas on some. Thank you. Good. Ouais, je propose que vers la fin de la semaine, on fasse un truc, on se commence déjà à faire un truc. Mais il faut qu'on mette un truc aussi, mais je sais pas, je pense à une tête en particulier. Je pense qu'on peut. Moi, je peux déjà commencer peut-être à faire un truc, peut-être un truc. Alors, je pense que je sais pas trop ce que j'ai un peu à mettre dans la tête. Mais je pense que d'ici le week-end, donc avant dimanche. Ik wil uiteraard alleen nog met één postulaat wel zitten met één postulaat. Comment ça marche? Je vais si on arrive à avoir une suffisamment grande résolution pour pouvoir reconnaître les types de films, ça serait vachement cool. Et aussi, par exemple, c'est pour les évolutions cliniques, par exemple des myopathies, des maladies, des muscles, genre voir des générescences, est-ce que ça attaque plutôt certains types, etc. Donc ça pourrait être un truc, tu sais, qu'on pourrait l'ensemble faire dans les catégories. Parce qu'il demande un peu de papier, si on peut dire, c'est est-ce que la résolution est suffisante pour voir ce genre de choses Si ça correspond à ce genre de Il y a moyen de trouver un truc assez. Enfin, tu sais, genre en conclusion. Okay, that's good to hear. <laughs> Special relativity at points I lost grasp of the concept. Okay. But just to for me to like solidify and consolidate everything, sure. How would you word that um, in terms of context? Is that simply that a person who's moving with a relative to someone else, when they measure a magnetic field in the y direction? Yes. Translating that into the person oh, that was stationary yes. gives you their magnetic field and a little bit extra yes. in the form of electric yes. field. That's and that's, that's not 
precisely though showing a special relativity, but that's the effect of special this relativity. This is the effect of relativity. The, the, we put relative, excuse me, we we'll put relativity in um, in the statement that contractions are invariant. And if you have a contraction to four vectors, you can show mathematically that that thing is invariant. That follows from relative from special relativity. So implicitly, it was built in in the whole contraction idea of the thing. So this is where this is where that came in. And it almost helps, obviously, to make everything a bit easier. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah, yeah. And you certainly don't want to do all of this in 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 in, in non. I was way. I was about to. Uh, how how much messier would this get if the V's were constant? Uh, very, yeah. uh, first of all, the way that you would transform to one coordinate frame to the other wow. would, would not be Lorentz transforms anymore, would be a more general expression, so that means things become more difficult. Secondly, it would mean, that's I think was your question, that the, the, uh, yes. you would get derivatives of the Vs themselves, mm -hmm. which adds extra terms. Yeah. And, uh, all types of accelerations in there. Yes, no. because you can, maybe you can already uh, imagine that if two observers are moving with constant velocity with respect to each other, then all of a sudden things change between corner frames, let alone what will happen if they start to accelerate. And the answer, by the way, is that they feel, what we now see is that you can turn an electric field into a magnetic field by starting to, const to have constant velocity. Mm -hmm. If you accelerate, you get, in addition, a gravitational field. So what we've now done, we've changed an electric field into a magnetic field. You can, by accelerating, even include gravitational fields. Beautiful stuff. It is beautiful. I mean, you can really see how things all of a sudden the gravity yeah. becomes part of this as well if you start to put acceleration. I was going to take general relativity, but you lost me. When you made that joke about the symmetric asymmetry, you lost me. Oh, I thought I was uh, in some uh, <laughs> French colleagues mostly, but. Uh, <laughs> I'll see you in your time. Okay, see you then. Goodbye. I got all this from my mama. <laughs> <laughs>